Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. Today we're going to answer a question. Of course, you know me, I'm going to go way beyond the question in giving the answer. Today's question comes from Marshall Harrison, W4MKH. I uh, obliterated his email there for a little privacy. Why does the transceiver expect 50 ohms for the antenna connection? Was it an arbitrary decision sometime in the past or some technical reason in the radio or something else? The answer, of course, is something else. Um, and so I'll just call this video, Why 50 Ohms? To find the answer to Why 50 Ohms, I looked at the internet quite a few different sources, and finally decided on Wikipedia's explanation as the most probable and the best explained. So let's look at a little history of this by using some pictures from Wikipedia, and then we'll go into some text. It turns out it wasn't arbitrary. Uh, there were technical reasons, and uh, there's I guess as good a rationale as any for why it's 50. But let's go back way into the old, old, old days of telephones on poles, uh, where people strung the telephone wires along. This happens to be a telegraph pole for a railroad, but uh, the original telegraph poles were very similar. It used to be that they used an unbalanced system. They'd put one wire on the pole and use the ground as the return. That resulted in horrible crosstalk, meaning that you could hear other people's telephone calls while you placed your own, and sometimes even talk with other people that way. So it was discovered early on if they put a telephone line out to a subscriber and then brought a line back to complete the circuit that they would have far less crosstalk but the problem still was not solved. They eventually went to uh, twisted pairs here each pair is one telephone line and uh, in order to keep twisted pairs from bunching up against each other, they would twist them at different rates so that they wouldn't end up with one wire running right next to a neighbor's wire for long periods of time. And this proved reasonably satisfactory for telephones, but when they were, they were still having crosstalk problems. Now it took a genius to figure out what to do about that, and in this case, the genius is Oliver Heaviside. Oliver Heaviside was a British polymath who lived from 1850 to 1925. He was a rather curmudgeonly old man um, and um, had a tenuous relationship with the scientific community. They did recognize the value in what he was doing, but many of them had trouble understanding it. He created what today we call differential calculus. The original calculus was invented by Isaac Newton, but uh, Heaviside invented the differential calculus. He also was one of the people who postulated a reflecting layer in the ionosphere, and for many years the layer was called the Kennelly Heaviside layer. And he did many, many, many things, but what this genius did, but what this genius did that was most interesting to us today is he proposed the idea, and this was radical, no one else saw it. If you put one of the wires inside the other wire, you can eliminate crosstalk. You go, what? Put one wire inside the other wire? Absolutely. The first coaxial um, transmission lines were pipes with a piece of wire or a thinner pipe going the length of the pipe inside with occasional spacers made of some non-conductive material. 
And at World War II, that was the beginning, what we started with was these rigid coaxial devices. But the neat thing about a coax is that it keeps everything about the inner wire inside the outer shield. This diagram here shows a source, a voltage source, AC of course. Uh, Zs is the impedance of the source. Z0 is the characteristic impedance, which can be calculated from the dimensions. Um, and ZL was the load impedance. And if they all matched, you got a perfect power transfer uh, from the source to the load. If they did not match, if there were mismatched things in there, then some of the power would be reflected back from the load to the source. They wanted to get the most to the end, so they were quite careful with uh, impedance matching. Do you understand the magnitude of the genius of this man? Who would have thought to put one of the wires inside the other? But that's exactly what a coaxial cable does. Coaxial means that they share the same center. Okay. Now, here is what uh, this is Heli Heliax, which is uh, an extremely low loss uh, cable that is available for an extremely high price. You'll see here that it's air insulated. This right here, this plastic piece is actually a helix that's wound down and put in there. And they've got grooves in here that this can all uh, work with. This cable right here is an inch and... Uh, uh, let's see, oh, that's millimeters. These are millimeters over here. These are 30 seconds. There's one inch. It's almost two inches in diameter. And you can see the size in the middle. It doesn't need to be filled with anything because all the energy is carried on the outside of the conductor and all the energy is also carried on the inside of the shield. This has got a perfect shield, of course. It's copper. Uh, there are no holes in the shield or anything. And so it, this kind of cable is the kind of cable that rich hams will put up to their towers so there will be absolutely minimal loss. And uh, then they'll often run one up there and then have a coax switch to go to different antennas that are on the tower. But this gives you the idea of a coaxial cable the axis of the inner and outer piece coincide. Now to really understand what happens with coaxial cable, I looked to the Wikipedia article on coaxial cable. Um, okay, and uh, an inner conductor surrounded by a concentric conducting shield, all right. And now in modern cable, instead of air in the middle, there is uh, this polyethylene or plastic dielectric that's inside here rather than the air dielectric in the original coaxial cables. We get a nice view of what's going on here with the plastic jacket, the metallic shield, the dielectric insulator, and the center core. The metallic shield can be brayed. Sometimes it's an actual aluminum shield. Um, like an LMR 400, there's an aluminum shield with a copper braid around it. Uh, the idea is to get as near as you can to 100% shielding in there while there is a little give and take on the cost. Now let's start working on Y50 ohms. Okay, um, the characteristics or Z0 of the cable a bunch of things cancel out and you end up with the square root of the inductance per meter divided by the capacitance per meter. Gives you the characteristic impedance. If you work that through, you come up with this equation down at the bottom. Z0 equals 138 divided by the square root of the dielectric constant of the material that you've got in there. And different kinds of plastic have different dielectric constants. 
and then you take the log of the uh, outer diameter, the, the inner diameter of the outer shield and the outer diameter of the inner shield is what this is right here. Okay, so the characteristic impedance of a cable has nothing to do with frequency once you get beyond the shield cutoff frequency, which is measured in audio frequencies. Um, you get to where it is strictly a function of the diameters of the cable and whatever material is put inside. Now, let's look at this. This was a Bell Laboratories discovery in 1929. This was a long time ago. The best coaxial cable impedance for high power, high voltage, and low attenuation are respectively 30, 60, and 77. Okay, so high power means that the coax is least likely to exceed the breakdown voltage of the insulator in between the dielectric. Okay. High voltage is a little different. That's not the same as high power. And then low attenuation. So you have 30 ohms for the high power, 77 ohms for the lowest attenuation. Now this might explain why cable television and satellite TV are all 75 ohm cable, because that's the lowest attenuation cable. Okay, now will that work for ham radio too? Yes, it will, if you uh, make sure that the um, breakdown voltage is enough that you can put as much power through it as you want. Okay, now they point out that at air uh, is center, 76.7 is the low attenuation point. When more common dielectrics are considered, the best loss impedance drops down between 52 and 64 ohms. Okay, one more of these technical charts in our last one from Wikipedia. Oops. Okay, the arithmetic mean between 30 ohms and 77 ohms is 53.5. The geometric mean is 48. Now, 50 ohms is right between these two values. Okay, the arithmetic mean means you add the two and divide by two. It's just an average. The geometric mean is a little bit different it's 30 times 77 and then take the square root and you get 48.1 ohms. These are pretty close and 50 ohms is right square in between them and that is where 50 ohms come from because it's a compromise between power handling capability and lowest uh, attenuation. Okay. So if you want to do just lowest attenuation, you can do 75 ohm coax. So if you are a shortwave listener, you might want to do that. Um, it's not going to give you even a dB difference, but um, there is technically some difference there. Um, and then the, the power handling capability is at 30 ohms. Well, I mean, one's more than twice the other. so. Uh, they compromised on something in between so they could use one cable for both. Now I want to turn to the American Radio Relay League's antenna book. This is the 23rd edition and this is figure 2.15. This right here is the impedance, the antenna impedance, the radiation resistance in ohms um, does not count the uh, ohmic losses, but if you have a pretty good cable or a pretty good dipole and you have the antenna right, uh, it's going to be pretty close to this cable. This is for a horizontal half wave dipole. That means half lambda. Now, I want to warn you in advance that half lambda is not the point of lowest SWR 
for a dipole. Uh, it will give you a slightly higher SWR, but it will give you a pur purely resistive one. It turns out that the resistive impedance and the reactive impedance are at right angles to each other. So a little bit away from the horizontal half wave can sometimes give you a lower SWR. You have to tune for it. Uh, just go out there and tune the length. But I want you to notice that the we've already looked at this in an S day video. The ideal radiation angle, I mean the lowest lobes, is when the antenna is a half wave above the ground, or half wave above the effective ground. Uh, in very rocky soil, the effective ground can actually be below the ground a little bit. If you go higher than that, you will find that your radiation, vertical radiation pattern starts to bifurcate and you get what's called lensing. Now at uh, the ideal radiation angle, half wave, it's 70 ohms. 70 ohms. So at 70 ohms, the SWR is 70 over 50. Each of those are SWRs, purely resistive. You can do this and you get 1.4 to 1. So you will not get an SWR better than 1.4 to 1. Well, we know that that is actually a good SWR in, uh, in actual practice. Also in actual practice, the height of the half wave, especially in 40 meters and so on, you can't get up to a half wave. So you're going to end up with it being lower. And note that the impedance goes up. Now, if it were to hit 100 ohms, that's a 2 to 1 SWR. So it'll be less than 2 to 1. Um, actually, in practice, your built-in antenna tuner will tune this out just fine. Okay, so we've looked at this interesting question of why 50 ohms. And we've discovered that it is a compromise between the lowest losses and the highest power capability. So if you're going to use cable, the same cable for both transmitting and receiving, 50 ohms is the best compromise. Now if you don't go anywhere near the uh, maximum capability of a coax cable to handle high voltage and so on, you can get away with using 75 ohm cable. I wouldn't try, uh, which would be RG6, which is available at Home Depot and Lowe's, dirt cheap. Uh, but it won't have the power handling capability that a 50 ohm cable will have. Now, 50 ohm cable is used extensively commercially, militarily, and in ham radio. And because of that, it's more expensive than the RG6 cable, which is used extensively, extremely extensively, in cable television, uh, satellite television, and all of that, which means just about every home has some RG6 in it somewhere. So because the 50 ohm cable is a little less used, you're going to pay a little bit more for it. And if you get a quality cable, you'll have a cable that can last you for years and years and years. There is no wear out mechanism on properly maintained coax. The biggest problem with coax is getting water in either end, which will gradually destroy the outer shield and uh, can cause it to oxidize and reduce its efficiency. So if you've got water in your cable, you, you need to replace it. There's not much you can do to repair it. Okay, so there we go. That's why 50 ohms. There's a solid reason for it. Please check out dcastler.com slash support for different ways that you can help fund this channel. Please subscribe, click like, and share. Thank you so much for your time today, and until we next meet, 73.